be Dr. Ronald Duman, who is the director of the Ribicoff Center, which we heard about today. And he's going to be talking about some novel antidepressant targets. Um, and invite everyone back and invite Dr. Duman up. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to follow the distinguished speakers and to, uh, to be able to be part of this uh, new initiative for um, the Moonshot and uh, one, one Mind. Um, I think with the impassioned uh, backing of, of uh, Patrick Kennedy and, and others, uh, we really have a chance at making uh, significant progress in this area. So I'm going to talk to you about um, work that uh, we've been doing in the field of depression uh, and uh, looking at antidepressant treatments. And just in the way of a little bit of background, um, you've already heard some of this. Uh, this is clearly one of the major uh, significant uh, mental illnesses that we're facing. It affects up to 17% of the population. Uh, and just think about that, uh, the significance and, and widespread nature of this illness. Seventeen percent of the population, almost one in five people, suffer from depression or a related uh, mood disorder. Huge economic burden to our society. Uh, and we do have some drug treatments, uh, but they require many weeks before they take effect. And even after many weeks, only about a third of the patients are effectively treated. We still don't understand the causes of depression, although I'll talk to you a bit about what we think may be uh, and some of the important causalities, as well as the mechanism for how these drugs act to treat depression, and, and what we think we may be able to do to create um, better treatments. In a particular, I'll talk to you about work that we've done uh, here at Yale, as well as other labs around the country, uh, looking at uh, a particular type of protein that uh, you've heard a little bit about in some of the other talks, uh, neurotrophic factors. And the idea that has uh, been formulated now over the past several years is that stress and depression uh, result from a loss of these neurotrophic factors, uh, in particular key brain regions involved in, in mood and depression, and leading to a atrophy and even loss of neurons in these regions and that there are structural changes, as well as neurochemical imbalances that occur in depression. But, the, and the important thing is, and I think the reason for hope for recovery here is that <clears throat> these structural changes are reversible. That, that antidepressant drugs and other types of treatments are able to reverse these loss of connections and atrophy that occur and to treat depression through those kind of mechanisms. So what are neurotrophic factors? It's from the, uh, comes from the Greek word trophicus for nourishment. We first learned about neurotrophic factors in studies of development. And they're important for the growth and survival of neurons. <clears throat> but what we've also learned more recently is that these growth factors and neurotrophic factors are present in the adult brain. They can continue to be important for survival and function of neurons, but also are very important for adaptive mechanisms that occur. And I'll talk more about this, but these kind of adaptive mechanisms are important for uh, functions like learning and memory, but also for emotion and mood. I'm not going to go into detail here, but the, what has been shown over the past several years is that stress, many different kinds of stressors, can lead to a loss of these neurotrophic factors, these important survival factors. And then antidepressants have the opposite effect. They can increase to different varying degrees the amount of these neurotrophic factors. And one that I'm going to talk to you uh, most about is uh, a nerve growth factor referred to as BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. I'm just going to give you a little background on the kinds of effects that have been reported uh, for the regulation and the effects of stress as well as depression and antidepressants on this particular nerve, gro uh, nerve growth factor. And what's shown on the top there is that uh, a, a, um, a measure of BDNF in one of the brain regions that we study in depression, uh, the hippocampus, 
And what you can see is that stress leads to a decrease in the amount of this neurotrophic factor. And this is a very brief exposure to a restraint stress in a uh, rodent. And you see a, a very significant uh, decrease in the amounts of this trophic factor in the uh, parts of this uh, area of the hippocampus. And this has been reported with different types of uh, social as well as uh, physical stressors. And now it's also been shown in human brain in studies from postmortem tissue. In, in the human brain, the hippocampus is located in this uh, area. And uh, in these depressed patients, there is also a very significant loss of BDNF levels. In contrast, what we found is that antidepressant treatments have the ability to have the opposite effect and to block or reverse the effects of stress. And again, on the top is uh, a study looking at Prozac, chronic administration of Prozac, leading to the opposite effect, increasing levels of this, this neurotrophic factor. And this has been observed with a variety of different classes of antidepressants, even electroconvulsive seizure, and even exercise, something that's known to also produce an antidepressant response. And importantly, once again, this has now been uh, confirmed in human studies in patients who were on an antidepressant at the time of death. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think it's important to point out that we've also uh, done a lot of work to examine the function of these neurotrophic factors and the changes that are occurring in our behavioral models. And of course, our behavioral models for a complex illness like depression have some limitations, but we are able to look at things like despair, helplessness. Uh, in this chronic stress model, which I'll touch on again toward the end, we can look at anhedonia or the inability to experience pleasure by measuring sucrose uh, preference that a rodent has. And what we found is that BDNF, if you infuse BDNF, it's sufficient to produce an antidepressant effect and that the effects of antidepressants require BDNF. So if you decrease or, or uh, delete BDNF, you block the ability of an antidepressant to have its therapeutic response or its effect in these animal models. Now I want to go into a little bit also about what happens uh, uh, and, and what um, evidence we have that BDNF is important in humans. Now we, it's not always enough just to say that this, uh, this factor is increased or decreased under different conditions. And, we're now able to get a little sense of that from, again, genetic studies of BDNF in human uh, patients. There's a particular uh, variant of BDNF that influences the processing and release of this trophic factor. And what's been shown is that in, in humans that it is associated with reduced episodic memory as well as uh, executive function, decreased hippocampal volume in normal subjects as well as depressed patients. And now there are studies looking at uh, the um, interaction with prior trauma and stress. And what's been found, and there's increasing evidence, is that if there's a prior exposure to trauma or stress and you have this allele or this variant of BDNF that decreases the available amount of functional BDNF, that there's an increased uh, vulnerability for depression. So very good evidence that uh, this particular factor is important in the actions of stress and depression and that in converse, the actions of an antidepressant to produce a response are dependent or involve this particular factor. So I wanted to go into a little bit of uh, uh, data now about what's happening. You know, we, I mentioned that we know that BDNF is important for influencing the survival and the function uh, of, neuro of neurons. And so we're now able to start looking at uh, how this um, could be impacted in our uh, preclinical models. In fact, we're able to look at numbers of neurons, count the numbers of neurons, and also look at the connections. And I'll just go over some of those data to, uh, to highlight that. And the first thing that, that I'll talk about is uh, what um, was first thought and, and found to be uh, quite a dramatic and, and profound effect that in the adult brain, uh, there remains the capacity to generate new neurons. So we originally thought that once you reached adulthood that there were no new neurons in the brain, but now we know 
in a variety of different uh, animals, including humans, that there are certain neurogenic zones in the brain, and you continue to have birth of these neurons. And one of those is this region that I just talked to you about in the hippocampus, where BDNF is sensitive to stress and to antidepressants. And here's a labeling of the new neurons that uh, are occurring in this particular brain region. And in this schematic, you can see that these progenitor neural stem cells lie in this particular aspect of the uh, hippocampus. They actually divide. They migrate up into the dentate gyrus granule cell layer and send out processes and basically take on the um, function of mature neurons. And what has been found is that different types of stress, again, have in common the ability to decrease this process, to decrease the numbers of these new neurons. And again, in contrast to what's happening with stress, chronic administration of an antidepressant increases the numbers, the proliferation and numbers of these new neurons. We're able to actually give a precursor that's taken up into these new dividing cells and measure the number of these new cells uh, in response to an antidepressant. This has been a major advance uh, to be able to look at this again in humans uh, and to provide some relevance for what's happening in the human condition. And there are now very recent studies showing that antidepressants also increase rates of neurogenesis in depressed patients. And importantly, there's very nice data now that these effects of antidepressants are dependent on uh, BDNF, this, this important neurotrophic factor that is upregulated by antidepressant treatment. So we have these new neurons, uh, and we've heard um, a lot today about connections in the brain. And so it's very important, of course, not only to have new neurons, but to have new neurons that have the right connections, not only in this brain region, but in other parts of the brain that are involved in regulation of mood and in depression. So the rest of the talk I'll spend on uh, telling you what these connections are and some new treatments that have been identified that are able to rapidly regulate uh, these connections. Now, this is work uh, that I'm going to tell you about from Dr. George Agajanian's lab, a colleague of ours at the Connecticut Mental Health Center. And what uh, George is able to do is to visualize uh, a single neuron in a slice from a rodent brain. So he's able to attach to the single cell and infuse a dye and visualize that one single neuron. There are many other cells in this, uh, this slice that, that are not shown here because he's able just to, to look at and identify this one single uh, cell. And what that allows him to do is then to look very specifically at these little uh, protrusions along the bran these branches of the cell and measure and begin to look at uh, the number of these connections, the function of the connections, and even the characteristics of these individual connections. And what's shown over here is the diagram Matt also showed you uh, of this uh, particular connection between cells. And the importance of these cells can't be uh, under, uh, these connections can't be um, underestimated. There are many cells in the brain, of course, that uh, don't change their connections a lot. Uh, motor areas that control movement uh, are not as susceptible to changes. But regions of the brain that are involved in learning and memory, and importantly, in mood uh, and in depression and regulation of those functions, these connections change on a regular basis. And again, think about what's happening here. Probably one of the most important fundamental functions of the brain. They're involved in the ability to sense, assess, and store complex information and make appropriate adaptive future responses. Think about that. We can't make, we can't build a machine that would do that or a computer that would do that. To sense information, assess that, store it, and then make changes appropriately in the future. That's a really fundamental function of brain that we think is playing a very important role in pathophysiology of depression and many other psychiatric illnesses. And we think probably if we can correct this, will also be important for um, treatment of these illnesses. So what's ha happening with stress? This is what George found, that exposure to 
a relatively mild stress, 45 minutes of a restraint stress per day for a week, caused this very significant dramatic uh, shrinking of the branches as well as the number of these connections uh, on these neurons. What he has also found is that in uh, animals that express this variant that decreases the availability of BDNF, that there's already a shrinkage of these cells. These, these cells, the neurons in these uh, animals that have this variant already look like they've been exposed to stress. So we think that that's probably playing an important role in the reduced memory, the decreased structure, and the increase in risk that this variant uh, has uh, in humans. So what about antidepressants? How do antidepressants influence this process? And I just wanted to, again, go back to available antidepressants. And I pointed out to you that, in fact, uh, some of the drugs that we have do increase uh, levels of BDNF. But the effects are rather modest, subtle. And they don't really affect the release of BDNF. They can affect the amount that's there, but it's not affecting the release. And that's critical to regulation of these synapses. The drugs also take weeks or months. It's a major limitation, particularly for patients who are suicidal. Again, only effective in about a third of the patients. There's a very significant uh, treatment-resistant population of patients. And, and these drugs, of course, have side effects. So this, this is an uh, example of a, um, a, a new treatment um, identified first here at Yale by John Crystal and, and colleagues. The amazing thing about this drug, ketamine, is that it's rapid acting. So within a day, even faster, there's a response to ketamine in, in very severely ill patients. These treatment-resistant patients even are able to respond uh, to, to ketamine. Within, again, a matter of uh, four, two to four hours, and then the effects are sustained out to about a week after that time. So very dramatic effect uh, of this drug. I would say um, probably one of the most significant findings in the field of depression in uh, 50 years. And I've been working in this field for a very long time, and really nothing like this has come along uh, in, in many, many years. So we were interested in looking at um, what ketamine does. And because of the rapid action of ketamine, we thought maybe it, it would be influencing these, these connections or these synapses. And that's exactly what we found, again, with George Agajanian, that a single dose of ketamine within 24 hours significantly increases the number of these connections or synapses uh, on these neurons. That's shown uh, in a colorized version here on the right. Um, and what you can also see is not only are there more of these uh, spines or connections that are, are making connections with other cells, but they're a larger size, which is indicative of ones that are more functionally connected. Now, we also have looked at this in a, uh, this chronic stress model. And the reason that this is important is that um, you know, depression is something that, that typically occurs over time. Uh, you may get these changes in the structure of the brain uh, probably occurring over long periods of time. And the question is whether or not something like ketamine can produce a rapid response. We know some of the other available antidepressants can have an effect in this model, but they take many weeks to produce an effect. So this is a real test of whether or not in our preclinical lab model if ketamine can produce a rapid response. And that's what we found, that even in animals exposed to many weeks of stress, that a single dose of ketamine was, again, able to increase the number of these connections and completely reverse the decrements that had occurred over the course of, of uh, several weeks of stress exposure. We also found, then, going back to um, this variant of BDNF, that mice that have this variant that decrease the amount of functional BDNF that in these mice, ketamine doesn't produce the same type of structural change, indicating that, again, BDNF is a very important critical factor for responding uh, to, to ketamine and, and other antidepressants. So we, we have a long way to go, but I think we've really made very significant progress. And I'm just going to summarize in a couple slides. <clears throat> 
what we think is going on with stress and depression, that we're getting a downregulation of this trophic factor that leads to regulation of a number of pathways that I'm not going to tell you about. But importantly, what the, what the result is that there's a decrease in the number of connections between neurons, these critical factor, these critical intersections between neurons that are play an important role for modulation and, and regulation um, by neurons. And in contrast, what ketamine is able to do is to rapidly increase release of BDNF and produce the opposite effect to reverse the effects of stress and depression and increase the numbers of these connections and produce an antidepressant response. So I've said, I think, I let you know what I think the impact of this is. It really represents a dramatic advance for the field, the ability to rapidly treat patients. It seems that ketamine is not, the effects are not limited to depression. There are some new studies coming out, one um, that's been reported that's very effective and uh, difficult to treat bipolar depression. This is uh, something else that's uh, been recently done here at Yale that um, in the ER where depressed or suicide patients come into the emergency room, given ketamine, within a matter of hours, the suicidality is completely reversed. These people and are better for weeks after receiving a single dose of ketamine. It's a huge advance for the treatment of and uh, control of suicide. The problem is ketamine is not the perfect drug either. It's a street drug. It's referred to as special K. It has side effects. It may have some neurotoxic effects with repeated dosing. So there's a real need for novel treatments, and there's a lot of work. Now that we know what ketamine is doing, we can start to really design and build new treatments that are safer and produce the same type of effects that can be used uh, chronically. And there's a lot of that work going on here as well as other places. Dr. Santa Cora will also talk about, uh, at, at the one of the breakouts, um, studies that he's doing with another drug that affects uh, BDNF, and that's uh, really is all. So I just want to um, thank, um, of course, uh, all the different organizations that um, fund this work, NIH, the Connecticut Mental Health Center, State of Connecticut, NARSAD, NAMI. Uh, of course, we can't do this work without um, all their help. But also all these people who work in the lab that uh, spend many, many hours uh, trying to uh, understand what the, how the brain works, how stress and depression are affecting the brain, and how to treat that. So I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. Yeah. So um, therapeutically, ketamine is much more, is even more rapid acting than ECT. Uh, again, the single dose, there's some anecdotal evidence of rapid response to ECT, but not um, like ketamine. We've done some work looking at these same signaling pathways with ECT, and it, ECT doesn't seem to do um, activate the same uh, intracellular pathways and synapse formation of these synapses either. So it's interesting that there's that difference. We fully thought that ECT would have some overlap, but it doesn't seem to. One yeah. It's still uh, only used for um, clinical research uh, projects at this point, but there's a lot of work going on here at Yale, Yale New Haven Hospital, to come up with a plan to make it avail more readily available to uh, patients. That's, that's work that's underway. 